I'd like to start as well by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we're meeting here tonight, uh, the Turrbal and Yegara people, and recognise their elders, past, present and emerging, and particularly thank Uncle Bob for his welcome, welcome to country. There's an enduring myth about the white Australian policy, and the myth is that it was the creation of the Australian working class, that workers fought for it, imposed it on the ruling class, defended it, and benefited from it. John Howard summed it up in a speech titled Politics and Patriotism, which he gave in Melbourne in December 1995, shortly before the horrible 1996 election, where he declared it was the coalition which finally put an end to Labor's white Australian policy. Up until the 1960s, the idea that the Labor movement created the white Australian policy was the proud boast of most Labor politicians and many union leaders. But the movement against the Vietnam War, which necessarily confronted anti-Asian racism, and the wider anti-racist movement of the time, sparked a whole new surge of interest in the origins of white Australia. The historians largely regurgitated the idea that it had been created by the Labor movement. In 1985, Anne Curthoys summed this up. A major issue in the 1960s and 1970s was whom to blame for its existence. So we've gone from boasting to blaming. In the first place, the most common answer from historians had been the working class, the trade unions, and the Labor Party. But even the most cursory glance at the historical record shows that from the gold rushes to the late 1880s, every single piece of legislation imposing racial discrimination and racial exclusion was passed by parliaments composed entirely, or almost entirely, of capitalists, and their direct political representatives. There was no Labor Party and virtually no union-backed members of Parliament. Then the Immigration Restriction Act, which allowed the customs authorities to exclude people on the basis of a dictation test, was written by Alfred Deakin, a bitter opponent of the Labor Party and strikes. The legislation was supported by every member of the bourgeois protectionist party which had 33 of the 75 members of the House of Representatives, and most members of the official opposition, the right-wing Free Trade Party, with 26. So whatever the coalition put an end to, it was a policy made by their direct predecessors. Almost all historians acknowledge that all classes overwhelmingly supported white Australia. But no historian had ever seriously examined the class motives that led the vast majority of the Anglo-Australian ruling class to adopt white Australia. Kasmin historical explanation was highlighted by Peter Corris in 1973, and he was a historian of the experience of indentured island labour. If racialism was an ingredient in the thinking and behaviour of all Australians, regardless of class, right through the political spectrum, the present emphasis of discussion on working class and radical racialism will be misleading to any attempt to understand racialism as a whole. What about the bosses? So that's the question I set out to answer through two decades of research. I concluded that the three broad agendas that led the majority of the ruling class to fight for white Australia were as follows. The first was a strategic concern, a concern that Chinese immigrants were a strategic threat to Anglo-Australian control of the continent, their physical control. The fear was sharpest about Northern Australia, where there were only tiny numbers of white settlers. And it was intensified in the mid-1880s when China was seen as a rising military power, having successfully resisted a French invasion of Taiwan. Alongside those concerns was a fear that Britain would fail to protect the colonies from demands made by the Chinese government because China was widely seen as a crucial ally in Britain's global conflict with the Russian Empire. The second agenda was that the majority of the ruling class was determined to build a modern industrial economy, which could be threatened by allowing, in their, their eyes, threatened by allowing a regime of plantation agriculture to develop in the north, based on exploiting unfree laborers from the Pacific Islands. This concern was driven by theories of slavery and by the experience of the United States, and especially the Civil War. The Civil War killed something like a million Americans. It was the most extraordinary and barbaric war of that entire era. 
The final agenda was the desire to construct a homogeneous population. This was seen as necessary for containing social discontent and creating space for bourgeois rule through parliamentary government. It was shaped by the arguments of John Stuart Mill, the dominant political philosopher of mid 19th century Britain, and really the true theorist of white Australia. Once I identified the significance of these three agendas, I discovered that the story of white Australia, the narrative of why and how we got it, was very, very different from existing accounts. And I hope to tell a little of that alternative story tonight. Now you'll notice already, I think, that I've made no mention of the oppression and exploitation of Aboriginal people. That's because up until 1901, the whole agenda of white Australia was primarily focused on immigrant labour. Of course, white Aboriginal people did suffer from white Australia. Uh, not they suffered, of course, from, from colonisation, but that was not part of this uh, construct of ideas, policies, and so on until somewhat later. So none of this is in any way to seek to whitewash the history of racism within the labour movement. So I'll end up by reflecting on some of the key misunderstandings and mistakes made by even the best militants in the movement. And while the greatest suffering was experienced by the people who were racialized, I also want to look at the price so-called white workers paid for accepting and embracing white Australia. Okay, so let me start by going through the three, what I see is the three agendas that the ruling class, uh, that drove the ruling class to push for and establish a white Australia policy. The first was the idea of Chinese people as a strategic threat. Most histories of white Australia begin with the gold rushes and the laws limiting Chinese immigration passed in Victoria, South Australia and New South Wales. But those laws were all repealed fairly quickly, which came as a surprise to me when I started researching this. In 1867, there were no laws in any of the colonies restricting the entry of Chinese people. The wave of legislation that led to the white Australian policy in 1901 began here in Queensland in 1876, when Parliament passed a new goldfields bill imposing higher licence fees on Chinese miners and business people. Then in the next year, in 1877, Parliament passed the Chinese Immigration Regulation Bill, which limited the number of Chinese people who could enter Queensland by boat and imposed a very punitive entry tax of £10. And this legislation became the model for laws passed later in other colonies. Now, there are a number of remarkable features about this legislation. First, the parliament which passed these laws was dominated by squatters, sugar planters, their urban representatives and supporters, people who supported the recruitment of Pacific Islanders for the sugar industry. Indeed, just a few years earlier, the Liberal government uh, of Queensland had tried to get Chinese workers for the pastoral and sugar industries. The sudden shift in their position was in response to the arrival of large numbers of Chinese people to the Palmer River goldfields in the far north. At the time, there were barely 200,000 uh, settlers of European origin in Queensland and only a few thousand in the far north. As uh, the number of Chinese miners grew towards 10,000 and then passed it, the ruling class became alarmed at the possibility they could lose control of the North. They started talking about Chinese immigration as an invasion. John Douglas, the Liberal Premier in 1877 said, he did not hesitate to make use of the term invasion for it really was an invasion. And as they were backed up by many millions of their countrymen, a more dangerous invasion than any which they might be called upon to resist by armed effort. And this rhetoric became systematic in the speeches of ruling class politicians in the decades following. The second interesting feature is that this attack on Chinese immigration was not a response to campaigning by the working class. There was hardly any labour movement at all in Queensland in 1877. Nor was it a response to anti-Chinese violence on the goldfields. In fact, there had been minimal violence against Chinese miners on goldfields since 1872. Organised attacks on Chinese miners only resumed after the press started hysterically attacking Chinese immigrants and after moves to start legislating against them. So the first threats against Chinese came in June 1875 after the first legislative moves against Chinese mining. 
the first serious physical attack came in October 1876, when a crowd of whites fired on Chinese attempting to land at Trinity Bay and Cairns. This came after the passing of the first anti-Chinese laws in Parliament and all the wild rhetoric that involved. And the third interesting feature of these laws was that the event that galvanised almost the whole of the ruling class behind racial exclusion was the action of the Imperial Government in London in vetoing the 1876 law. Lord Carnarvon, the British Colonial Secretary, declared that the Goldfields Act defended British, Britain's policy of open borders and in particular contravened various treaties of peace and amity entered into between Britain and China at the point of a gun we might add, which gave citizens of both powers the right to enter each other's territory. In the preceding months, the British Korean news, Brisbane Korean newspaper, the Brisbane Courier in 18, the 1870s <coughs> was a serious and sophisticated publication. <laughs> the exact opposite of today, of course. <laughs> a very serious paper, it's really worth reading. It had rejected scaremongering about Chinese immigrants. But two days after the Goldfields legislation was vetoed, or it got news of the, the veto, it accused the imperial government of assisting the Chinese invasion. Australia cannot be both Chinese and British, it wrote. Every Chinese immigrant, by his presence amongst us, renders the colony less attractive to European immigrants. In Parliament, the far right of the ruling class, the very richest men in the colonial Parliament, swung behind this argument. Sir Arthur Palmer, the leader of Queensland squatters, made it clear he was against filling the northern portion of the colony with Chinese. The equally wealthy squatter, Joshua Peter Bell, declared, no action in this matter could be too strong to prevent this country being inundated by Chinese. The obligations placed on the Australian colonies by the treaties with China would continue to be a sore point. The coordinated legislation against Chinese immigration agreed to by the colonies in 1888, which was really the first white Australian policy, was sparked when the Chinese government complained about discriminatory legislation and the imperial government demanded to know the reasons for it. There was open speculation in the British and Australian press that Britain had a secret alliance with China in its global conflict with Russia, and the Australian and ruling classes couldn't trust the British to stand up for their interests in controlling Chinese immigration. This was a nationalist response, but it was not an anti-imperialist nationalism. Quite the opposite. Its aim was to more firmly secure the ability of the Anglo-Australian ruling class to control its territory within the wider British Empire. Many writers have explained the hostility to Asian immigrants as being a product of Australia being a colonial settler state. And I think that's broadly right. But there is an additional factor. Australia was and still is a relatively sparsely settled colonial settler state. And that has magnified that hostility. It's also driven the Australian state's obsession with forward defence, which of course we now see as the driving force behind the nuclear submarines, the talk about conflict with China, uh, and so on. Okay, the second great ruling class agenda was, was a concern to, to stop Australia becoming a country which institutionalised some version of slavery or racialised indentured labour. This was most eloquently summed up by the Tasmanian Attorney General Andrew Inglis Clark when responding to the demand I just referred to that the colonies explain the reasons for their anti-Chinese laws. Inglis Clark argued that if significant numbers of Chinese people came to the colonies, they would either threaten the supremacy of the present legislative and administrative authorities or if they accepted an inferior social or political status, they would, they would create a combined political and industrial division of society upon the basis of a racial distinction. This would inevitably produce, in the majority of the remainder of the population, a degraded estimate of manual labour, similar to that which has always existed in those communities where African slavery has been permitted and therefore, thereby call into existence a class similar, similar in habit and character to the quote unquote mean whites of the southern states of the American Union before the Civil War. 
Society so divided, he wrote, are doomed to certain deterioration. And this response was regarded by all the media across Australia as the most brilliant response to the imperial authorities. Now note that Clark was not arguing that Chinese immigrants would undercut established wage levels for European labourers. His argument rested on nearly a century of mainstream bourgeois liberal critiques of slavery. So this bourgeois critique combined humanitarianism, evangelical moral individualism, and laissez-faire economics. So Adam Smith had argued that free labour led to a greater intensity of labour than slavery. John Stuart Mill agreed, labour extorted by fear of punishment is inefficient and unproductive. All processes carried on by slave labour are conducted in the rudest and most unimproved manner. And J. E. Cairns, the author of one of the most widely read critiques of slavery, argued because this labour was so crude, it was, quote, quite impossible that, that the slave should take part with efficiency in the difficult and delicate operations which most manufacturing and mechanical processes involve. Now, let's pause here to note that this was an argument that slave-based or unfree uh, production was insufficiently exploitative. It was not an argument grounded in the interests of either the workers in bondage or so-called free labourers. Now, for the ruling class, this was no abstract problem. Nearly 40% of Australia's land mass is in the tropics, north of Rockhampton. And most colonial politicians were convinced of the racist myth that white men could not safely do manual labour in this cl climate. So they were left with the thought, which was terrible to many of them, that the only form of economic development that was possible involved plantation-based agriculture, exploiting some form of indentured coloured labour, which in turn raised the spectre of slavery, economic backwardness, moral corruption, aristocratic rule, and social degeneration. But of course, as we know, in North Queensland, there was a large and growing sugar industry, but it had been developed by kidnapping, recruiting, and exploiting indentured Pacific Islanders. For the urban and liberal bourgeois of both Queensland and the Southern Australian colonies, this was, in the words of Queensland Governor Musgrave, a system as much like slavery and the slave trade as anything can well be. So here's the problem. Sugar was driving colonisation of the north coast of Queensland, stimulating all kinds of capitalist industry, for instance, in the manufacturing of equipment, as well as producing housing and food and other essentials for the white population. To shut the sugar industry down would cripple Queensland's colonisation. To allow it to grow wood in their minds be to plant the seeds of a society divided by race and the terrible possibility of a future war between North and South. The seriousness of this can be seen in a proposal made by New South, New South Wales Premier Henry Parks in 1879. He proposed to merge the three main southern colonies, not a federation, to merge them, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia, with Queensland deliberately excluded. Her capabilities of soil and climate, he wrote, so clearly mark her out for a colonising career dissimilar from that of her elder sisters. Now, of course, the Queensland uh, ruling class completely rejected this, but nevertheless, it gives you a sense of the seriousness with which this agenda was treated across the country. Now, this issue of indentured labour on the sugar plantations unleashed the most bitter political struggle within the Queensland ruling class in the 19th century. In the mid-1880s, at the same time as the sugar industry boomed, recruitment of Pacific Islanders became more difficult. There was only a limited population of them. The recruiters just started to turn back to kidnapping, while the planters, backed by the Conservative government, launched a campaign to recruit labourers from British India, which of course was already providing plantation labour for other British colonies. This became the central issue in the 1883 general election in which the Conservatives were defeated. The Conservatives responded to this defeat by recruiting Chinese labourers. The Liberal government responded by imposing tighter limits on Chinese immigration, 
and then legislated to allow the indenture of European immigrants on wages far lower than standard, which I think shows you how little their opposition to racialized labor was driven by the activities or interests of the labor movement. The planters responded to all this by launching a fight for the separation of North Queensland into a separate colony whose government they expected to dominate. And this broke the broad ruling class consensus which had tolerated the limited use of indentured Pacific Islanders within the wider Queensland economy. In September 1886, the representatives of the separation movement in the Queensland Parliament moved a motion for the division of the colony. Now, they expected the motion to be defeated. What they did not expect was that every single non-Northern politician, conservative, reactionary, as well as liberal, squatters, as well as urban capitalists, voted against it. Many of these had supported the sugar industry and ex its exploitation of racialized workers. But they did not support anything which would, re would reduce the size of Queensland's internal market, and more importantly, they did not support anything that would take Queensland down the American road. And they were very explicit about talking about avoiding the American road. The Brisbane Courier again. Political severance from the great bulk of the European population of Australia will intensify the social effect of the change in population. The obvious effect of labourer and employer being separated by the broad bar of colour and race. A northern aristocracy, a race aristocracy will confront the Australian white democracy. And no strong effort of imagination is needed to picture the result. A legacy of evil is that from which America only rid herself by the most terrible fratricidal war which the modern world has seen. And again, just to be clear, this was not an argument against all indentured racialized labor. It was an argument that this needed to be contained, to be a minor part of the economy, one of whose effects was to be restrained by the democratic majority. Now the revival of Pacific Island labor recruitment in the 1890s was consistent with this position. A desperate and brutal decision by Sir Samuel Griffith who joined forces with the conservatives of McElroy, a decision that lasted only until Federation allowed the wider Australian ruling class to terminate the labour trade to the dismay of the planters. This experience alone ought to explode the myth that the bulk of capitalists or even pastoralists wanted cheap coloured labour. And it profoundly undermines the idea that the labour movement played some significant role in this, certainly prior to the 1890s. So for instance, the weekly meeting of the Brisbane Trades and Labour Council held a few days after the motion for Northern separation was moved in Parliament, and everyone knew what the consequences of that were, what the agenda was. That meeting did not even discuss Northern separa separation, much less mobilise on the issue. Okay, the third of these great bourgeois agendas was the campaign for a homogeneous population. This was the belief by the ruling class that a free and democratic society needed to be culturally homogeneous. And that by threatening that homogeneity, people of colour, Chinese people, Pacific Islanders, would threaten freedom and parliamentary government in Australia. So this supposed need for a homogeneous population was a central thing in all the official memoranda sent by Australian colonial governments to London in 1888 in response to Britain's demand. Earlier in 1880, the Brisbane Courier had outlined the overarching reasons for limiting the use of quote-unquote coloured labour. It is not merely or mainly because white workmen dislike Polynesian labour, not Polynesian, but that's beside the point here, that we are legislating to restrict it within as narrow bounds as possible. It is because we are desirous of forming as far as climate and the circumstances of the colony will allow a homogenous community. So at one level, the idea that Chinese people or Pacific Islands could not be part of an Australian community is just pure racism, as is the idea that their very existence would be a threat to democracy. But I argue that there's more involved than just pure imperial racism. Colonial politicians were dealing with a serious issue for all ruling classes. How do we maintain control? How do we prevent the working class from becoming rebellious? How do we contain their discontent? In arguing for a culturally homogeneous population, 
They were drawing on theories argued by Britain's leading, leading political philosopher, John Stuart Mill. In his book, Considerations on Representative Government, Mill argued that parliamentary government based on free institutions was the best and most stable form of government. But like all societies, this, this kind of government faced the danger of rival interests, including the working class, tearing society and the state apart. To avoid this, free institutions, which by which he means parliamentary government, uh, you know, freedom of speech, all that kind of stuff, required racial homogeneity. And he uses that phrase, a dominant nationalism and strong support for law and order. His book, Considerations on Representative Government, is obsessed with the danger posed by, quote, the ignorance and especially the selfishness and brutality of a mass. The uncultivated herd who now compose the labouring masses. That source enmity, which is universal in this country towards the whole class of employers in the whole class of employed. In such a society, universal suffrage was dangerous. It may well produce, he wrote, a legislature reflecting exclusively the opinions and preferences of the most ignorant class. <laughs> Mill is historically remembered as a leading liberal, and amongst other things, that normally means a defender of the Enlightenment. But this potential threat to property led Mill to embrace some of the key political ideas of anti-liberal, anti-establishment reactionaries, such as Samuel Taylor Coleridge and Thomas Carlyle. They wanted a return to the values of the Middle Ages. They railed against the rising bourgeoisie, arguing its individualism, selfishness and laissez-faire would produce the destruction of society. And if anyone's ever read the Communist Manifesto, this is the current that Marx critiques in, his, in the second part of the Manifesto, which I could never understand, the feudal socialists. <laughs> While rejecting their attacks on liberal economics, Mill, Mill praised these reactionaries for identifying the three requisites, which are essential principles of all permanent form of social existence. These were a system of education for citizens which aimed at teaching them to subordinate their own desires to the broader needs of society, a role played, quote, in modern nations, principally by religious teaching. A second, a feeling of loyalty to some element of society's broad constitution, quote, something which is settled, something permanent, and not to be called into question, something which enables society, i.e., the routine of capitalist exploitation to weather the storms of internal dissension. This could be, he said, adherence to a common god or acceptance of an hereditary ruler or ruling class. And finally, cohesion among members of society, a, a sense of common feeling in some sense, an attachment to the state or nation. Thus a stable parliamentary democracy was only possible this is my phrasing, where the ruling class was able to assert ideological hegemony over the population as a whole, and also strong institutions capable of making compromises between rival interests and enforcing them. In this, Mill rejected the democratic ideas of earlier thinkers, quote, in which it was customary to claim representative democracy for England or France by arguments which could equally have proved it the only fit form of government for Bedouins or Malays. Thus, class hegemony and racism were fused in Mill. A racial idea of the nation became a means to contain class struggle and social strife at home. Thus, it was neither in laborism nor classical liberalism, but in the aristocratic anti-liberalism of the early 19th century that one of the principal intellectual foundations of the white Australian policy can be found. The idea of the homogeneous nation protected by strong immigration laws against people who supposedly could not assimilate into a British culture. In embracing racial exclusion, the labour movement was strengthening the ruling class's strategy of ideological domination over the working class. Now there were, however, many problems with Mill's ideal of homogeneous population. One of the most obvious was that no nation on earth was homogeneous. Britain and France themselves were multinational <coughs> and multi-ethnic states. And anyone who's travelled through Wales will know that you can often share a cage with people speaking Welsh as their native tongue. 
In an infamous passage, he argued, nobody can suppose that it is not more beneficial to a Breton or a Basque of French Navarre to be a member of the French nationality than to sulk on his own rocks, the half-savage relic of past times revolving in his own little mental orbit. The same remark, he said, applies to the Welshman or the Scottish Highlander as members of the British nation. This was the idea that the English race had a unique power to assimilate the people of certain other societies. In reality, the pursuit of homogeneity necessarily involved the oppression of minority language and cultural groups. It intensified social division around identity, the problem it claimed to be dealing with. Again, something I think that's familiar today from the right. As a colonial settler state, the people, people in Australia had been a deliberate process, quite unlike the construction of European nations. Vast sums of money had been spent to attract immigrants, and parliaments, newspapers, and the public debated the kind of people they wanted. Most contentious were the Irish. They were easier to attract as immigrants, and their labour was needed, but they came with potentially dangerous ideas. <laughs> Both Roman Catholicism, which was seen by the Protestant elite as an obstacle to progress and a profound antipathy to British imperialism. The tensions between Catholic and Protestant, between Irish nationalists and those who identified with British imperialism, meant that no Australian nationalism that, in that included the Irish could describe itself as English or British. And I think this is the real significance of the phrase, the concept, of a white Australia. It was potentially inclusive of the Irish, as well as substantial numbers of Northern European immigrants. It meant that an immigrant of Irish Catholic origin could identify with Australia and Australian nationalism while hating the empire to which the Australian state was committed. So I now want to turn to show a little of how this approach to the issue of racial exclusion can change the way we understand one of the key events in the making of white Australia. The famous seafarers strike of 1878 to 1879. This was by far the largest industrial struggle before the great strikes of the 1890s. The dispute began in July 1878 when the Australian Steamship Navigation Company, the largest shipping line in Australia, replaced 180 European sailors with Chinese workers. The sackings were initially fought through a mass campaign against Chinese immigration. When hundreds more European sailors were sacked on the 18th of November 1878, the Union launched an all-out strike. Wharf labourers in Sydney supported them. They refused to load and unload ASN ships, while coal miners in the Hunter and South Coast refused to cut coal for ASN steamers, paralysing most of the fleet. The company responded by recruiting hundreds more sailors from Hong Kong to use as strike breakers. At the height of the strike, there were mass anti-Chinese riots in the city and regional centres, with Chinese people beaten and their shops and homes torched. Historians such as Anne Curthoys have argued that the strike laid the basis for the weakening of capital's interest in Chinese as a source of cheap or even extra labour, and that this was a precondition for the emer emergence of a nationally supported white Australia policy. Now, I have already shown that most politicians who represented capitalists, large and small, had no such interest in 1878, and that they were opposed to such a strategy. With few exceptions, the mainstream newspapers, run by large and small capitalists, strongly supported the seafarers and their strike. The evening news, Sydney's largest circulation newspaper, I think it was Australia's largest circulation newspaper. Its politics were Protestant, militantly free trade, pro-empire, pro-law and order. It was contemptuous of poor people and the Irish, saturated with racism, ridiculed trade unionists and opposed strikes and supported the Seaman strike. Because this strike was different. This is a British colony it thundered and we wish to maintain its essentially British character as the best heritage we can hand down to our children. Capitalists, it argued, had a duty to the nation and the race, and ASN were betraying the nation and the race. Right through regional New South Wales, most lesser papers agreed, and many campaigned against 
ASN and in favour of the strikers. Most of the argument that sees the ruling class as supporting the use of Chinese workers as cheap labour rests on opposition to the strike by the Sydney Morning Herald, the leading capitalist newspaper, and the refusal of the unelected members of the New South Wales Legislative Council to pass legislation limiting Chinese immigration. I'm going to just briefly deal with those. The Sydney Morning Herald's opposition to the strike was not grounded in support for Chinese immigration. For nearly a decade, it had run the most appalling racist and dishonest exposés, vilifying Chinese people and its editorials warned of the special dangers supposedly represented by Chinese immigrants. Just months before the dispute began, the president of the Siemens Union, no less, praised the Sydney Morning Herald for doing all it could to show what the colony would suffer if the yellow agony were admitted into it. But when the strike began, the paper bitterly attacked the union. But this was on a class basis. The workers had broken their contracts of work and that was the more immediate danger for them. When the strike was finally settled, it became even more fixated on the class dimensions of the strike, railing against the moral degradation of people looking to the government for protection. In 1979, in the wake of the strike, the Parks government proposed legislation restricting Chinese immigration. In this legislative council, the, the unelected council full of the richest uh, people in the colony, there was not a single comment approving Chinese immigrants as cheap labour. The majority in the debate over Parks' legislation addressed the ruling class concern for strategic control and colonisation and the idea that this would be threatened if Chinese immigration were not restricted. Those who opposed the bill saw no immediate danger. Others opposed to the legislation saw it as an attack on the principles of free trade. It was in Queensland, of course, where the press was most vociferous, and the conservative press, in supporting the Siemens strike. The conservative papers were the most militant in support of the strike. The Brisbane Courier editorialised, as a rule, strikes are bad things. But if anything can justify a strike, and a general exhibition of public sympathy with the strikers, the step, step taken by the company would do so. And it argued that the growing military power of China justified the strike. Naturally, an anti-Chinese committee had been organised in, in Brisbane. It met, not at a trades hall, but in the rooms of the Brisbane Chamber of Commerce. They wanted public meetings called across the colony. So when it came to Ipswich, they wrote, not to the miners' union, but to William Ginn, a prominent Ipswich merchant and councillor. Ginn's own attitude to unions was made clear at the meeting he organised. Personally, he was not in favour of strikes. They were injurious to the men themselves, to their employers and to trade, and their pernicious influences extended far beyond the immediate places in which they took place. There was no record of local unionists or miners being involved in this meeting. But that wasn't going to stop the hardy merchants of Ipswich. They called a meeting on the issue for Ipswich's coal miners. After traipsing out to, quote, a green near the immigration depot, the well-fed William Ginn, Ginn met with indifference. The miners agreed only to invite the Brisbane seafarers to send a speaker to inform them of the facts of the matter. Many feared destitution if they took industrial action. ASN were finally defeated when a ship bringing 350 Chinese workers sank in Torres Strait and when the Queensland government stripped the company of its lucrative mail contract, something the Queensland Conservatives had been demanding. I'd just like to sum up the arguments so far. The politics of racial exclusion that we saw in the late 19th century which morphed into an explicit white Australian policy were really class policies enacted for those three primary reasons. I'm not going to repeat them. With the ending of indentured labour in the sugar industry and the expulsion of many islanders, and with the agreement that the new Commonwealth would take over responsibility for the Northern Territory, the second agenda was essentially fulfilled. The first and third remained key drivers of government policy well into the second half of the 20th century and arguably today. So for instance, the government set up a tax on sugar paid for by working class Australians 
to fund the employment of as many white workers as possible in the sugar industry for strategic reasons. In other words, to settle white families in the north, which Alfred Deacon said was cheaper than stationing an army there. This in turn required the industry to export most of its production, and this was only viable with the subsidy paid for by Australian families. The government, of course, is still spending billions to quote unquote develop the north. The third agenda also persisted, right through the 1950s and into the 1960s, but means his government was defending white Australia to the newly independent governments of Asia on the basis they were just ensuring the homogeneity of the country and the stability of their society, just as those new governments were themselves trying to do. It didn't wash particularly well. When the far-right ex-Labor politician Graham Campbell, who I'm sure many people here remember with, well, I don't know, sadness, bitterness, whatever, got up in Parliament to argue against Asian immigration in the 1990s, he too quoted from John Stuart Mill and considerations on representative government to justify his racism. And today assimilation remains a cornerstone of immigration policy, even if explicit racial homogeneity has been replaced. So I now want to wind up by just briefly summarising what I see as the price paid by workers and the labour movement the quote-unquote European white working class and the labour movement for its embrace, acceptance of the white Australian policy. The first thing it did was it led unions and workers to support their bosses against other workers. Chinese workers were not slaves. They were not an instrument that allowed the rise of an aristocracy over the parliamentary system. They fought for their rights and were just as willing to strike as other workers. And this is now more and more being documented by historians. For instance, in Melbourne and Sydney, non-Chinese furniture workers were sucked into a campaign against Chinese-made furniture, a campaign that only strengthened their bosses, while Chinese workers showed a willingness to take industrial action against their own bosses. When they looked for solidarity or offered solidarity to non-Chinese workers, they were rebuffed. Some years ago, I did research to see if there was any relationship between Chinese immigration and wage levels and found there was absolutely none. Chinese immigration never led to a fall in wages or living standards. And when Chinese immigration was stopped, there was no improvement in wages. Indeed, the greatest collapse in living standards ever in our history happened four years after the ending of Chinese immigration, as the 1880s boom collapsed into the Great Depression of the 1890s. Second, it allowed the enemies of the labour movement to be presented as friends of the working class. I think the classic example of this is the ambivalent attitude of the movement towards Henry Parks, the long-serving Premier of New South Wales. When Parks, and there's many examples I could give, I can only give a couple. When Parks pushed legislation restricting Chinese immigration through Parliament in 1888, the New South Wales branch of the Siemens Union passed a resolution assuring Parks, quote, of his having earned the well wishes and admiration of the 10,000 seamen composing this body. In reality, Parks was a bitter enemy of the working class and organised labour. Just a year earlier, amidst rising unemployment, he cut rations to all but the most destitute and used police to smash protest demonstrations. In 1879, that's basically just after the um, seamen strike, seafaring strike, he had responded to a minor strike in the Hunter Valley by sending in artillery not police with guns, artillery to intimidate the strikers. And in 1888, just months after the Secretary of the Sydney Trades and Labor Council told Park, Parks that it behoves us to support them who support us, he did it again. There are many other similar examples. In 1888, Queensland workers, or certainly the majority of the Queensland population and many Queensland workers, voted for the Conservatives led by Sir Thomas McElroy in the belief that the Liberals, led by Griffith, were soft on Chinese immigration. Two years later, his government would round up the leaders of striking shearers and send them in chains to an island prison. Third point, the disorientation of the labour movement in terms of white Australia and racial exclusion, I think, was partly driven by a populist view of the ruling class. By that I mean the belief that one prominent section of the ruling class represents the ruling class as a whole and represents some special danger to the labour movement. The sugar planters and the minority of the squatters 
might have been very rich, but there was a wider ruling class that used the power of the state and its influence over much of the media to discipline them and pursue a very different agenda. In reality, the urban capitalist class in the Australian colonies at the time was the most substantial economically and the dominant political factor. factor. The construction capitalists, food manufacturers and breweries, equipment manufacturers, footwear and clothing and so on. And to that we can add state capital. The railways, ports and so on all represented vast capital investments and they all wanted broad-based capitalist development. That broad ruling class agenda I described was not hidden. Everything discussed in this paper was openly canvassed in the newspapers and parliament, journals and books. I think there's a long-standing problem in the labour movement attempting to find a section of the ruling class that it is progressive because it has differences with other powerful sections of capital. Whether they're the banks, there was once a focus on the money power in the labour movement, mining companies, multinationals, not based in Australia because we have our own, whatever. So I think that's a, an, an interesting uh, factor for discussion and reflection. The working class paid because this facilitated the construction of a hegemonic ideology of Australian nationalism based on racism. This was a this saw Australian society as white, as inclusive of the origin of the European immigrants, rather than as nationally English or British, as I said, and ultimately loyal to the British Empire. Now I'm not going to dwell on this because it's discussed widely by other historians. But it's worth listening to the assessment of W.G. Spence, the famous if conservative organiser of the Shearers Union and then the AWU. In his memoir, Australia's Awakening, published in 1990, he argued that where once republicanism had been a force in Australia, the practical independence of government granted under the Australian constitution, with the manifest advantages of being part of a big empire and under, the, under its protection if need arose, Together with the growth of the national spirit of a wide Australia, the broad humanitarianism taught by the Labor Party, we have developed a feeling of loyalty to race rather than governments, but have abolished any talk of either republicanism or independence. That ideology of loyalty to race drew the working class behind the imperial and sub-imperial agendas of the ruling class. The idea that Asian peoples were poised to invade the country and threaten the livelihood of Australian workers helped mobilise workers to accept conscription, introduced by Labor in 1910, and to join the army with the outbreak of the bloodbath of 1914-18. to 18. The Labor government at the time did everything possible to send as many young Australians to the killing fields as possible. As far as they were concerned, the British Empire had to win the war because Australian capitalism relied on British markets and investment and relied on the Royal Navy for protection of its trade routes and its insecure grip on this vast land mass. But just as importantly, they feared another power getting control of German colonies in the Pacific, and particular Japan's imperial ambitions. So Australian lives were sacrificed so that Australian sub-imperialism would directly control all of PNG, along with Nauru, Bougainville, and dominate the rest of the Southwest Pacific. And I might just add that after the First World War, when Australia got a special mandate for control of all of Papua New Guinea, the first legislation it passed in relation to that was a, a, a version of the White Australia legislation. I'm, I'm old enough to remember the way the government and DLP persuaded so many workers to support the Vietnam War by using images of Asian hordes descending on Australia with big arrows pointing from China down to the north, down, down southwards rather. Imagery straight out of wide Australia. No, it hasn't changed much, has it? Okay, conclusion. It was an historically important achievement for that earlier generation of activists and historians to insist that white Australia was racist, that it was not about defending living standards, and that racism had disfigured the labour movement. But they were wrong about who was responsible. Getting to grips with the real history of white Australia doesn't just strengthen our ability to fight racism, which we must, but to better understand the nature of the capitalist system, its state machine, its ideologies, and the rival strategies of its major capitalists. So this has been a rather dense talk on ruling class history. But isn't the ruling class one of the major actors in labour history? Isn't a better understanding of them 
as well as of our own movement, essential for waging the class struggle today, and of course, for transforming society tomorrow.